I went to bed at halftime. One dollar. Set, set my DVR. Thank you. What's your story? Um, set my DVR. Got up super early, and the thing ran out at the end of the fourth quarter. Oh! <laughs> missed it. You missed Congratulations it. Congratulations to Alabama. It's happening now. It starts right now. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> No Fox News alert. Republicans and Democrats set to lock horns, you might say, yeah, on immigration. Right. Yep. President Trump is about to host a bipartisan group of lawmakers at the White House this hour. Good morning to you. I'm John Scott. And I'm Melissa Francis. The president and leading lawmakers expected to tackle everything from the dreamers to his prized border wall. As Democrats look for a fix to shield hundreds of thousands of those dreamers from deportation, President Trump is now set to begin real negotiations made it very clear he wants to have uh, secure the border interior enforcement we want to end chain migration and close the loopholes including ending the diversity visa lottery For the democrats um, i think it's a bit hypocritical on their part if they uh... they, they were ones in two thousand and six who basically supported uh, these uh, physical uh, border uh, barriers and you know it's time for them to come to the table let's strike a deal the president wants to strike a deal with the democrats and the time is now to do it chief white house correspondent john roberts is live with more on all of this busy day john uh, it is. It's always a busy day here, Melissa. Sure. Good morning to you. And we're going to start with a little bit of breaking news. Uh, Fox News has learned that in the next 24 hours, the White House expects to confirm uh, the uh, details of a high-level delegation that the administration will be sending to the Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea, starting on February the 9th. We are told, it's not confirmed at this point yet, that it's likely the delegation will be led by Vice President Mike Pence. Now, this would be a very strong signal to North Korea, which has uh, just yesterday announced its participation in the Winter Olympics, that the United States stands squarely behind its ally, South Korea. Uh, this uh, move by South Korea to get North Korea into the Winter Games is seen as perhaps a potential icebreaker here in this crisis. So we'll see if further developments go on from here. Now to the meeting at the White House, which starts in a half an hour. About 20 Democratic and Republican members of both the House and the Senate will be here to talk about immigration. What's notable is that none of the big four from leadership, Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, will be here. Among the people who will attend, though, the House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Whips John Cornyn, Dick Durbin, and Steny Hoyer, Judiciary Committee Chairs and Co-Chairs Chuck Grassley, Diane Feinstein, Bob Goodlatte, Mike McCall, and Betty Thompson, the Chair and Ranking in the Homeland Security Committee, will be here, along with other notables such as Lindsey Graham, Heidi Heitkamp, and Henry Cuellar. The White House, we're told, will present a group of proposals and requests to the uh, the assembled uh, folks here today. Uh, they'll tell them what the President wants on the wall, detaining ending immigration loopholes, ending chain migration, and a number, the number of new ICE agents that the president wants to help uh, enforce our customs and immigration laws. White House Senior Policy Advisor Stephen Miller on Tucker last night said he believes the president's got the political high ground here. Listen here. If Democrats oppose a border wall, they're just saying they want continued, unending illegal immigration. Look, Democrats ultimately have to make a choice. They care a lot about providing a benefit to illegal immigrants. We're saying to them, if you want to make that deal, then you have to deliver benefits for American families and American taxpayers, too. And if both sides are willing to agree to those terms, Tucker, then we can have a deal. Steve Miller is going to be at that meeting a half an hour from now. Also attending, of course, will be the President, Chief of Staff John Kelly, Kirsten Nielsen, the new Homeland Security Secretary, as well as Mark Short, the Legislative Affairs Director, who said a short time ago on Fox Business that uh, he wants to reach a deal on this with Democrats, but doesn't understand the Democrats' negotiating tactics. Listen here. We want to find a solution for them, too. But what I don't understand is the Democrat position to say, we're going to shut down the government. We're going to stop funding our troops. We're not worried about our national security needs that we need to get funded until we solve a situation of illegal immigration. Mark Short, they're talking about the so-called Dreamers Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. They've gotten until March the 5th to try to work that out. The White House says that it's kind of tired of driving the bus here, wants to see a counter-proposal from Congress on what to do about the Dreamers. Clearly, the president needs to get Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi on board, even though they are not here. But I'm told this meeting is really all about people who want to get to a deal as opposed to want to play politics. One thing also, Melissa, we should point out that the president's attorneys are potentially planning for 
for, and that might be the possibility of an interview of the president by the special counsel Robert Mueller as part of the Russia investigation. Now, I'm told that this interview may never happen. That's a real possibility. But the president's attorneys, I'm told by sources, do expect that Mueller will, before the end of the investigation, which they think may come in the next few weeks, will ask for an interview of the president. So they want to be prepared. They want to make sure that if there is a sit down, that they don't just put the two of them in the same room and say, OK, uh, uh, special counsel, uh, have at it. They want to have a defined set of parameters about what topics will be talked about, what questions will be asked and what won't be asked, which mm. is just as important. Melissa? Sounds very dicey. A lot to work on there. Get back to work, John. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Talking about dicey, just in on the Korea crisis with the North and South holding their first formal talks in more than two years. Both sides agreed to more discussions on reducing military tensions along the border, while the North said it would actively cooperate in next month's Winter Olympics in South Korea. But there was no mention of nuclear weapons or missiles. What North Korea wants to see at these talks, apart from an agreement on how to join in the Winter Olympics, is very much it wants to see South Korea coming to the table and engaging with the North on its own terms, without outside forces, as the Korean leader Kim Jong-un referred to them. That means the U.S. or other countries involved. It's calling on a Korean sense of nationalism or pride and asking South Korea to deal with the North Korea on its own terms. Whether this can be successful going past the Winter Games remains to be seen. Joining us now, Michael Singh, former Senior Director of Middle Eastern Affairs at the National Security Council, also Managing Director of the Washington Institute. Michael, good morning. Morning, John. So North Korea is sitting down with its counterparts from South Korea. Um, how significant do you think this is? Well, John, I think that, uh, you know, so far we've seen President Trump welcome this and obviously uh, indicate he'll send his own delegation to the Winter Olympics. Uh, and I think he's right to do so. Anything that could calm tensions and sort of ensure security at the Olympics uh, is in our interests. But I do think that we need to keep our expectations realistic here. My guess is that what the North is trying to do uh, with this gambit is to blunt the pressure campaign we've seen against North Korea in recent days uh, and also potentially drive a wedge between the U.S. Uh, and South Korea by sort of playing to uh, things they know that the South Korea wants that uh, the United States might not agree with. So you think the North is buying time? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen this pattern time and time again, where as soon as pressure starts to ramp up, uh, the North will sit down for talks, uh, look to be sort of paid simply to, you know, stop its provocations for a temporary time, but, but ultimately see no uh, ultimate solution to the problem that we're dealing with, which is uh, the North's nuclear arsenal. Jerry Seib is the Washington managing editor of the Wall Street Journal, frequent guest on this program. Here is something he wrote in the journal, uh, talking about how the tensions remain, even though the, these talks are underway. He writes, but as just one sign of how fraught, fraught the situation remains, simply consider this. U.S. officials are quietly debating whether it's possible to mount a limited military strike against North Korean sites without igniting an all-out war on the Korean Peninsula. The idea is known as the bloody nose strategy. React to some nuclear or missile test with a targeted strike against a North Korean facility to bloody Pyongyang's nose and illustrate the high price the regime could pay for its behavior. The hope would be that be to make that point without inciting a full bore reprisal by North Korea. The bloody nose strategy, Michael, what do you think of it? Well, obviously, John, the key word in that passage is hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, when, when we come up with these types of uh, halfway measures, it, it's, there's, a, there's a tempting reason to do it. You're hoping uh, to get a lot of benefit uh, for a lot less risk than, say, a full military attack. Um, but often what happens is the opposite. You end up in t taking a lot of the same risks you would for a, a full military attack for a lot less benefit, because even if you succeed without triggering that escalation into, say, nuclear war, um, ultimately, what have you accomplished? North Korea still has its nuclear arsenal. You still need a denuclearization strategy. Maybe you're getting a sort of temporary pause in testing at best. Well, what about the sanctions program? Uh, you indicated earlier that, that the sanctions may be part of the reason that North Korea decided to uh, join these talks underway right now. Well, that's right, John, and that's why I think you know it's important that we not uh, look for sort of quick fixes here, either by sort of getting too excited about these talks and starting to lift pressure uh, or by precipitously moving into a military action. Probably what we're going to need is a longer term effort, a la, say, the Soviet Union, to really degrade and undermine 
the regime, which means keeping pressure up, it means keeping our military forces in the region strong and keeping our alliances in the region quite strong as well. I suppose part of the uh, danger of, of the so-called bloody nose strategy is that any reaction might be disproportionate. I mean, the United States could launch a limited strike on some North Korean facility and the North Koreans could launch what they consider a limited strike on Seoul, but that would result in potentially tens of thousands of deaths. Well, you're right, John. There is a risk there of that sort of tit-for-tat escalation getting out of control. There's also a risk that a lot of observers worry about that the North might not interpret a strike as limited. It might see the strike coming uh, and think this is it, this is an all-out strike. And so the messaging around that, sort of ensuring the North understands what you're doing and doesn't escalate, uh, can be tricky. So if you were advising President Trump and, and those who are dealing with the North right now, what would you tell them about uh, uh, what, what is the next step after these talks in Panmunjom? I would say that it's fine to talk. There's no reason not to explore a potential diplomatic opening. But at the same time, we have to be able to not just keep pressure in place, but continue to ramp up pressure, both in terms of sanctions as well as in terms of our diplomatic and military posture in the region. You have to sort of be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and use all those instruments together for one coherent strategy. Michael Singh. Michael, thanks very much for your expertise. Thanks. Oprah, in 2020, the idea gained steam among Democrats since her speech at the Golden Globes on Sunday night. Now even the White House is weighing in. Plus new details. Of I have a bathtub I love. Call today or learn more at bathfitter.com. Pain used to shut me down during pickup games. But with odor-free Blue Emu Continuous Pain Relief Spray, I can box out any muscle or joint pain immediately. Blue Emu Continuous Pain Relief Spray. It works fast, and you won't stink. Right now, police in Washington state arresting a 32-year-old suspect after a sheriff's deputy was shot and killed Sunday night. Authorities say that man is in custody for unrelated warrants, but they could upgrade the charges. Deputy Daniel McCartney was the first officer at the scene. He died in the hospital after he was shot. One other suspect also involved, that man was killed. Deputy McCartney was a Navy veteran, a husband, and the father of three, vo three boys. Oprah Winfrey is very talented. She brings people together. She's not divisive. She makes you feel warm inside. And right now, our country is very divided. And what she did last night was she healed us. She brought us all together. And that is what is needed. Breaking here on Happening Now during our hour, new reaction to all the speculation about Oprah Winfrey running for president after a powerful speech at the Golden Globes on Sunday. A White House spokesman now weighing in, saying President Trump would welcome the challenge of facing off with the TV star. Let's bring in Jeff Mason, White House correspondent for Reuters. First of all, do you buy that? Sure, I buy it. I was on Air Force One last night when Hogan Gidley, who was the spokesman who, who made those remarks, made them. And I think, I think what his point was is that this president is confident he can take anyone on, whether that's Oprah Winfrey or whether it's somebody else that the Democrats put up. It is very hard for me to believe that she would actually do this. I mean, first of all, it looks incredibly painful and uncomfortable to run for president. I don't know why anyone wants to do it. I mean, you have to really, really want the job. And her life right now is fabulous and cushy. Um, it, it's <laughs> seems like she'd be insane. You think she'd really do it? Well, it's hard to say. It, it certainly does seem like she has a great life, uh, but she also is somebody who has said many times that she believes in, in uh, inspiration and believes in, in having a calling, and if she decides that this is her calling, uh, it seems like there are some Democrats who would call her as well uh, and ask her uh, to, to take, up the, take up the mantle. That said, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions about an Oprah Winfrey candidacy. There are a lot of things we don't know about her views right. on policy issues, uh, and so there's a lot of questions that she would have to answer that, of course, she hasn't uh, had to do just yet. No, there's a lot that we don't know about her point of view. And I think people out there, especially when you see Democrats embrace her, they assume that she would be very liberal. But at the same time, you have to wonder, you know, I mean, she's an incredible business mogul who has driven very tough bargains in order to own her brand, um, make it the way she wants it. She's fought back against all kinds of things and, and, and you know, made her empire what it is. You got to be tough. You got to know about tax law. I mean, you got to understand how businesses work. We don't know that she would necessarily be that liberal. 
Well, and that's a good question. You know, the fact that she endorsed Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, certainly makes people think that she would lean towards Democratic uh, candidates and towards Democratic policies. But she has said before that she has voted both for Democrats and for Republicans. So that certainly raises some questions about what, what her thoughts are on specific policies. And as you say, yeah. uh, Melissa, she's a, she's a businesswoman uh, and a very successful one at that. And sometimes people associate that with more Republican-leaning yeah. uh, policy. So she that's those are all things that we would have to find out. No, I mean, in my mind, she knows what it takes to make a business work. And a lot of that, you know, from a pure CEO standpoint, seems to go more with smaller government, lower taxes, you know, we would see. But regardless, um, she also hasn't been put to the very uncomfortable scrutiny of the press, at least for a very long time, because she's been so popular. It's not, it doesn't sell magazines to write an article about you know anything negative about Oprah but she's fair game you can already see people attacking some of her charities some of the things that she's done in the past she may not come out the other side being as popular as she is now what do you think well, for sure, that's a risk, and you've seen that with Hillary Clinton as well, who had really high popularity ratings when she left the Obama administration as Secretary of State and when she was in office as, as a senator and um, and as the, as the First Lady, and, and her, her ratings then would go down uh, very dramatically once she started running for office. So yeah. that's something that could happen to Oprah Winfrey as well. Um, and again, you know, she she has said before several times that she's not interested in running for, for public office. But but that speech really drew yeah. a lot of attention, and people are now thinking that maybe maybe she would throw her hat in the ring. But there are certainly downsides, like you've just said. Without question. All right, Jeff Mason, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. My pleasure. I, I know there was a time when Oprah would sign all of the paychecks personally for yeah. her empire. Maybe that's still true today. But uh, she was very involved, is very involved. Absolutely. But you often see, too, with these master of the universe type people who have conquered so many different things mm -hmm. that they think think this is the mountain left to climb. I mean, she's been incredibly successful, broken all barriers. Even though it would be uncomfortable and she has no reason to do it, she might be like, I could do this well. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. A fired Google employee who sent a memo claiming there were fewer women in engineering because of genetic differences that favor men is now taking legal action against Google. Details on that next. Plus, and get a two-year price lock guarantee, plus free standard installation. So what are you waiting for? Get HughesNet Gen 5. To order, call 1-800-728-2340. Be sure to ask about our home phone service, too. Call 1-800-728-2340 today. The State Department says serious concerns remain about the safety of American diplomats in Cuba. This comes amid concerns of possible sonic attacks on U.S. diplomats in Havana. Secretary of State Tillerson standing by his decision to order most State Department employees and their families to leave the island last September. If I can be convinced that I'm not putting people back intentionally in harm's way, then that's the way I feel about it. I'll be intentionally putting them back in harm's way. Why in the world would I do that? Meantime, a recent FBI report concluded that there is no evidence sound waves impacted any American's health in Cuba. Cuba has denied any involvement or knowledge of any targeting of Americans in their country. Well, the author of the controversial memo inside Google is now suing that tech giant. James Damore, who was fired after the memo was leaked to the media, is filing a class action lawsuit claiming Google still engages in harassment and career sabotage of anyone who holds conservative viewpoints. William Lajeunesse live in Los Angeles with more on that. William. Well, John Damore fired was, oh, was fired by Google rather in August after he basically said the company was in trying to promote diversity discriminated against white men. Now, we posted the lawsuit at the top of foxnews.com if you want to read it. It contains dozens of screenshots of internal Google documents and forums. What makes it interesting is the detail. Where in so-called diversity summits, the suit claims white men were booed, that managers were told they'd be penalized if they didn't hire 50% women or meet minority quotas. Now, when Google was asked for feedback, Damore wrote that infamous memo. 
The negative response was huge. One said, a fellow employee said, quote, you're a misogynist and a terrible person. I will keep hounding you until one of us is fired. Blank you. Another wrote, if Google management cares enough about diversity, they should, and I urge them to send a clear message by not only terminating Demore, but also severely disciplining or terminating those who express support. Yesterday, Demore spoke to reporters. There's uh, continued harassment and career sabotage of anyone that expresses a conservative viewpoint. And there's constant shaming and attacks against uh, white men within Silicon Valley. So Google said it fired Demore because he perpetuated harmful gender stereotypes. So why does it matter? Well, Silicon Valley politics skew to the left. Executives at Facebook, Google, Apple give overwhelmingly to Democrats. So that's fine, but the lawsuit contends that that liberal point of view dictates and influences news and content that we consume, promoting liberal stories and silencing conservative ones. Now, Google says it looks forward to defending itself and its diversity efforts. What is clear here, John, is the culture war is alive and well in Silicon Valley. On Reddit, that memo generated 10,000 comments. Back to you. Wow. wow. So it, it's not over yet. Uh, William Lozman, thank you from our Los Angeles Bureau. A major mob crackdown in Italy leading to more than 160 arrests. How police are putting an end to one crime family's international reach. Plus, President Trump and lawmakers from both parties working on a deal to protect dreamers, as some Republicans say Democrats could let the government shut down if they don't get their way. We're going to ask our political panel about those major battles playing out. Expert and chef-crafted food. Call now to get rapid results by Jenny Craig. It's happening. February 23rd, Publishers Clearinghouse awards the 5000 a week forever prize. Win 5000 a week for your life. Then after that, someone you choose gets 5000 a week for their life. Enter at pch.com before it's too late. And February 23rd, win forever. A major crackdown on crime across Europe, Italy and German police conducting a series of mob raids, arresting more than 160 people and seizing some $60 million in assets. Amy Kellogg is in Milan, Italy with the details. What's behind all this, Amy? Well, as the prosecutor in southern Italy, where this crime family is based, just told me, Indragata, and that's the name of the syndicate, Melissa, is so rich now that they don't even need to kill people anymore. They can just buy them off. It was an absolutely eye-watering sum that this family had accumulated in assets that were seized in raids overnight. And as you can see, the reach of this clan, called Farao Marincola, again, part of Indragata, that powerful organized crime syndicate of Calabria, their tentacles reach all the way up through Italy to Germany and throughout Europe. There were some big arrests in the U.S. a few years back as well of Andragata members. These guys were cornering the markets and supply chains for pizzerias. They were dealing in food and wine and also funeral services, among other things. Here were some phone intercepts picked up by the police. Quote, oil is gold, fish is gold, bread is gold, the dead are gold. Now, of course, these businesses were used to launder real money made by uh, the syndicate in cocaine, arms dealing, and people trafficking. Over 160 people were arrested today, including dozens in local administration. When we talk about power, we have to think that the mafia the Indirigeta vote and get others to vote, but in this case, they actually put their people in administrative positions. They have dozens in public administration. According to the prosecutor, this was one of the biggest arrests uh, when it comes to organized crime in the last 20 years, and the cooperation with German authorities was also quite key in terms of nailing the case down, Melissa. That is amazing. Amy Kellogg, thank you. Uh, Fox News alert and 2018's first big political battle heating up at the White House right now. President Trump meeting with a bipartisan group of lawmakers to talk about immigration. That sit down comes as a looming budget deadline also hangs over their heads. A legislative priority for the administration, the, uh, the administration says Democrats are using for leverage on immigration. Unfortunately, the Democrat position has been to say we're not going to agree to any additional spending until there's a deal on DACA. And while we're anxious to get a deal on DACA, we feel it's improper to hold hostage our troops who are working so hard to protect us over a position on illegal immigration.
Joining us now, Leslie Marshall, syndicated radio host. Also with us, Gianno Caldwell, founder of Caldwell Strategic Consulting. Both are Fox News contributors. Uh, it seems uh, that, Gianno, that the, the American people generally do not like it when their government shuts down, and they usually blame the party that's responsible. The question is, who would people feel is responsible if this shutdown were to happen? Well, honestly, we're talking about the Democrats, which are holding everything up with this disingenuous mm -hmm. vow to fight over DACA. They're legitimately holding 11 million people, the dreamers, that is, uh, uh, hostage over political points. And this is where we are in this country at this particular point in time, especially when we think about what the fight is over, the dreamers, and what uh, Democrats are now saying is a divisive issue when people like President Obama, as U.S. Senator Obama, uh, President Clinton, and Hillary Clinton in 2006 voting for the Secure Fence Act. These folks are now saying that this is a divisive issue when they were for it before they were against it, at least having a border uh, with the southern uh, southern hemisphere. So I'm, I'm finding this to be very troubling that Democrats want to score political points when there's real lives on the line. Uh, Leslie, uh, you know, there was a time when, when Barack Obama had the White House and had the bully pulpit. Why did Democrats not deal with the Dreamers then? Well, actually, Democrats tried to deal with the Dreamers, uh, John, and this is something that's had bipartisan support, but they just never uh, make it to the finish line. And what happens is at the end of the day, I couldn't disagree with my buddy over there more in the other studio. Uh, I, 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 have to, I have to tell you, it, it, it's just amazing to me. Do you remember a guy named George W. Bush? He was a president and he was a Republican, and he actually uh, was in agreement with what Democrats are, are asking for now. Uh, the problem here is, are we going to hold hostage dollars or dreamers and dreamers are being held hostage regarding a wall and some want to blame democrats for saying look no more dollars when we want to deal with human beings uh, the dreamers first and foremost neither side wants to shut down i certainly hope it doesn't come to that but i don't think there's going to be a wall we don't have the money and you can't but, use these people uh, as as a bargaining chip to get that leslie the president who won the election could not have been more more plain with his campaign uh, plank that he wanted to build that wall and it got him elected. Why should he not pursue it? Well, first of all, he said Mexico was going to pay for it, so there would be a broken campaign promise. And politicians breaking campaign promises? Oh, me oh my. Uh, in addition to that, we don't have the money to pay for this uh, wall in, with billions in the B. And uh, furthermore, uh, the security risk to the United States don't come in through Mexico and are not because uh, we have right now the lowest illegal immigration passing over the border in Mexico. Uh, we have something in front of us called a computer, and that's how these terrorists like ISIS are recruiting individuals and we have these lone wolf attacks here and worldwide. Mercedes Schlapp, who is, is a, a White House communications advisor, was on Fox and Friends. Gianno, I want to listen, I want you to listen to hear what she had to say about this argument. Listen. Okay. I think the Democrats are really running a very big risk if they go in this direction of, of basically saying we're going to you know, we're going to hold on the spending bill because of this DACA deal. And here is the president saying, come over to the White House. Let's talk. Let's get this done. But, you know, the American people, what they want, they want to make sure that our homeland is protected. They want to make sure that we have real immigration reform It's why the president was elected and the president will deliver. So is it risky for, for Democrats to try to make demands uh, in exchange for, you know, some kind of a DACA deal, Gianno? I think it's very I think it's very risky. The fact of the matter is the DACA program, the executive order was an unconstitutional executive order. The uh, Constitution tells us that the Congress does have the say so over immigration policy. I think the Democrats are really hedging their bets because they know that the Hispanic population is going to be the uh, minority majority in this country. And when we think about sanctuary cities like my hometown of Chicago, I know that the reason why people like Mayor Rahm Emanuel are holding um, um, uh, uh, undocumented immigrants to, to this standard is because he knows that every 10 years there's a census. And what does the census do? It counts people. It doesn't matter if they're legal or not. And what does that number do? It provides a number of congressional seats. And what, do, what happens there? Um, it gives power to a particular state and funding, which gives, uh, especially Democrats, patronage jobs and all kind of other things. So again, this is a disin uh, disingenuous effort by the Democratic Party because they're not caring about the lives of these dreamers that are really on the line. Because I have friends that are dreamers. 
consumers. Mm -hmm. They care about the power in which they get in the mm -hmm. political points 2018 and the 2020 election. That's their consideration. Well, Otherwise, they would make a deal because they were willing to make a deal some years ago. Leslie, there's a bipartisan meeting underway at the White House. Uh, last question. What are the chances they actually come to some kind of agreement? I don't think there'll be an agreement today. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I think uh, quite the opposite of what Gianno just said, uh, which is uh, Republicans don't want these dreamers to become citizens because you know that they are going to 99.9% .9 vote Democrat because the Democrats have done more uh, for immigrants undocumented and otherwise in this country historically. And uh, bottom line, John, Republicans will be blamed if there's a shutdown because they're in power Not in the White all. House and mm. in both chambers of Congress. Not at all. We, 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 are, see. we are a nation of laws. We are our nation of laws and everyone has to submit to that there has to be a procedure in place no one just gets in for the strength of it we and, have to and, be a nation of laws and i've talked to a lot of legal immigrants who are upset about people jumping the line in front of them uh, but that's another topic for another day leslie marshall Gianna caldwell thank you both did okay, fbi okay. officials working on the russia investigation leak vital information to the media the tax reportedly prompting questions in congress and what the U.S. can do to tamp down leaks, plus growing fears of a double of stroke and heart disease. After all, four out of five people who have a stroke, their first symptom is a stroke. So call today and start with a free health assessment to understand your best plan of action. So why didn't we do this earlier? <laughs> Lifeline screening. The power of prevention. Call now to learn more. Parts of Southern California still reeling from wildfires are now preparing for another possible disaster, mudslides. Officials say rains in the forecast could be too much for hillsides left charred and barren by the fires, and they are warning residents nearby to be ready. Now, with the rains coming, we hope that, uh, that you know, the mountain will hold. I work in Santa Clarita, and it came down all day, so I figured I'd better get home and get sandbags around my crawl spaces, otherwise I could be floating. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of problems. It's better to make sure that, you know, everything's covered and all your bases are covered. Some neighborhoods in Ventura County have been evacuated. Other cities are placing sandbags on streets and clearing storm drains to try to prepare for the flow of water and debris. Mm. Congressional lawmakers are now reportedly looking into whether the FBI may have been behind some of the leaks to the media on the Russia investigation. This is prompted by the text messages between Peter Stroke and Lisa Page shortly before Election Day in 2016, suggesting they knew about a Wall Street Journal article in advance, at least. Agent Stroke, of course, was removed from the investigation after other anti-Trump texts. Joining me now with more on this is Morgan Wright. He is a cybersecurity analyst and senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government. There are a couple different issues here. One of them has to do with the idea that it's possible that this British spy, Christopher Steele, was out shopping around right. parts of the dossier to the media and you know everything that that may entail and then also these text messages going back and forth where you have these two talking about articles that have been published and you know they're saying things like um, you know boy that was fast should I quote find it for the team right. and then they talk about how the article was um, you know very anti-bureau and they're glad they threw this one under the bus because the article didn't come out the way they wanted what does all this mean to you uh, quote Jerry Maguire, follow the money, in this case, follow the data. When you follow the data, you follow the messages, you follow the emails, you follow the phone calls, you, you follow whatever the, the trails are out there. What you're going to ultimately find, I believe, is that there's more collusion between the DOJ and the media than there is between the Trump campaign and Russia. It's just, you know, uh, Melissa, the, the real sad fact about this is, is that this has a huge downstream effect for an alliance, one called the Five Eyes, U.S., Canada, uh, U.K., Australia, New Zealand. People are not wanting to share their information and intelligence with us for terrorism, for crime, for military operations, uh, you know, and for our forces, because we can't keep anything secret. All yeah. of the stuff getting out there is only hurting our national security at home and abroad. You know, when you see the text back and forth, it seems like they're sharing information because they want to shape public opinion. I Absolutely. Whether it is about their bureau or it's about the president or a special investigation, whatever it is, they're trying to influence how the public thinks. And I don't think that's something that people normally think FBI agents are out doing. We think of FBI agents as right. investigating wrongdoing. 
Look, uh, this pit is the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. I got friends, uh, FBI on down, state and local, love these folks. The problem is you get up to the point where it becomes political. You're right. They're, they're just leaking this information to shape public opinion. The same thing they're saying the Russians were trying to do with their influence operation, which was shape people's opinions about Trump or Clinton and get them to vote a certain way. This shouldn't be happening. I mean, mm -hmm. this information should not be coming out. And, Melissa, at the level it's coming out at, at the height, uh, you know, in terms of the hierarchy and where these senior people are, that's very distressing because it means that it's a coordinated effort and because they are insulated like that, they're going to do a lot more to protect themselves. If you're a traditional line agent or out there on the street, you'd yeah. be hosed over something like this. They're getting the protection so that's based the on the question. level they That's the question is, is it against the law? Because what they're doing, you're saying it's dangerous to our national security because it makes right. our allies feel like our FBI agents are out leaking all kinds of information for political benefit or whatever, so they don't want to give us information. Is it illegal? What do they have to be sharing in order for them to actually be in trouble? You know, some of it's there's going to be a variety of things. One is it's not illegal. It may be against bureau policy. Uh, the Office of Professional Responsibility inside the bureau will handle that. Uh, could be violation of DOJ guidelines. But when you start talking information, maybe it's sensitive, maybe it's classified, which we hope it's not, or maybe yeah. it violates certain laws about what uh, the, the things you're not allowed to do, especially with the media, because you've got to remember the government and the media and our CIA and the media have had a very strenuous uh, relationship for a lot yeah. of years. So we've got to be careful about that. Going back to the Christopher Steele thing before we go. So it seems right. like now this British spy, Christopher Steele, who manufactured this dossier that turned out to be just a smear campaign and the facts within it weren't true. Um, it was paid for, at least in part, by the DNC and the Hillary Clinton campaign. Right. He then shopped it to the media before, you know, it, do we know was it used to get FISA warrants through the FBI? But this kind of shows you this trail of this document that was that was fabricated and all the different things it was used for. What's the danger in that in your mind? Uh, follow the data again. What's the danger is that people rely on this. Somebody will source it inside the FBI or inside the intelligence community. They think it's coming from the FBI instead of this dossier. So people say, oh, it has to be true because it's coming from the Bureau to where the Bureau, if they haven't